get full access to RFR only on Patreon. Become a member of the RFR Patreon community to get more Rebel Force Radio. Bonus shows and content are available right now only at patreon.com slash rebel force radio. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Well, nobody told me this. Apparently, on the Falcon ride at Galaxy's Edge, you can actually recreate the iconic smooch between Han Solo and Princess Leia. They actually have that that uh, corridor. I guess it's not a corridor. A little uh, alcove. Alcove. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. They have the alcove recreated. And uh, it's a, you know, it's a photo op where you can have your, uh, you know, your own little moment there. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'd be able to keep it to just the photo op, though. That's the problem. (laughs) Do they have that little that little thing that Leia is trying to, you know, what is that? She's trying to move that lever. The little levers and then she like pushes it and then pushes it back into the wall. Yeah. It doesn't look like. That uh, that if it's there, it's it's already in the wall, so you don't get to do that. Okay. But uh, now the story uh, over at moviephone dot com, they're 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 talking about this and said that you know you can recreate their famous banter. I love you, I know, and as we all know, that's not the banter from that scene. Cheese movie phone, please. It's not canon. No, no, no. That's 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 the whole. Uh, you know, I'm a nice man. That whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I happen you to can't, be a nice man. You can't insert Cloud City dialogue into a scene that clearly happened on the Millennium Falcon before that actual iconic moment between Han and Leia. What is wrong They're, with these people? I don't know. They're uh, not re- hey, well, while we're talking though about uh, smooches between Han and Leia, and that's what we were talking about. Uh, get this: I have not heard this. Uh, so Tim Rose, right? Good guy. We've, uh, met Tim. I've met Tim. I know you have as well, uh, played, uh, Admiral Akbar in Return of the Jedi, as well as in, uh, Force Awakens and in, I think he was also in The Last Jedi, right? Did he do the, yes. did he do the suit, uh, the, the, the suit work? He did. Yeah. And that, okay. Uh, he also was the, the puppet master for uh, Slacious Crumb in Return of the Jedi. And he was Howard the Duck. Really? Yeah. He was Howard the Duck. He was a Muppet Show contributor. He worked on Dark Crystal. Okay. All right. Tim has a very strong career as a uh, collaborator to some great films from that era. Well, we had Mark Dodson. Now, he did the voice for Salacious and the laugh, but he didn't do the, the, the puppeteering. So, But you, you do get great stuff with Tim Rose ad-libbing as an English speaking salacious crumb in the uh, classic creatures documentary. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about because Tim Rose has revealed recently. And I think for the first time that on the set of return of the Jedi, he was, uh, he, he made Harrison Ford very angry and Harrison Ford went over and had some words with director Richard Marquand. So here's the scenario, right? Yeah. Princess Leia just frees Han Solo from the carbonite slab. And, you know, they have the whole scene. And, uh, you know, who are you? Who are you? Someone who loves you. (laughs) Right? And they smooch. And apparently Tim Rose is there on the set 
as the curtain goes back and reveals Jabba and his denizens. And uh, he goes, we saw you kissing. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently uh, that seems, you know, very uh, benign. No harm meant. But uh, that didn't go over very well with Harrison Ford. And no. apparently he uh, stormed over to Richard Marquand and said, are these puppet characters going to laugh over my line? Because I'm not coming back to do a ADR. <laughs> He's got better so, things to do. Yeah. So apparently uh, then they all got a lecture from Richard Marquand telling that they all had to stay silent and mime their reactions. And they, they would add the laughter later. Uh, so, um, anyway, um, <laughs> well, he threatened to have him fired. Well, no, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there because <laughs> what Tim didn't know is that he had a hot mic. There was a hot mic under the floor where he was performing Uh oh. and he, uh, was, was doing a salacious crumb type voice. And apparently he's like, hey, this Harrison guy, is he going to talk over our laugh? Because it's really putting me off. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it for Harrison Ford. He just he just left. Yeah. And he said he wasn't coming back until the person who said that was fired. Yes. Fired. Gone from the set. Well, um, apparently the... The the the, uh, the way this this wrapped up was that Harrison knew what Salacious Crumb looked like, but he didn't know the guy that was playing him. So right. he wasn't going to know, <laughs> uh, you know, who was fired, who was hired. So I guess um, uh, Marquand basically told Tim Rose, "Hey, if anybody asks you, you got to tell him that you're the new guy <laughs> that we fired." the other guy and you're the new guy now i know that voice <laughs> but i mean this kind of stuff does happen yeah on film sets quite sure. often especially when you have a guy there who is a superstar like harrison ford who's being paid a lot of money and uh in harrison's case may be there a little reluctantly I can't believe we're doing this again with the walking dog. But, um, yep. Well, that was I the mean, third you know, movie so he was, this was like him just yeah. trying to get out of jail here. He was right. He had already established Indiana Jones mm -hmm. in the years between Empire and Jedi. So his star was really shining bright at that time. And a lot of things that happen on the sets of Hollywood movies um, can be rooted in things like, you know, split second decisions based on very emotional responses and rooted in ego. That's not uncommon for Hollywood at all. I think you have to be very careful on a set in those sort of circumstances. Oh, look at Christian Bale. I mean, very famously, that guy totally lost it. Oh, he on lost some poor mind. sap that was just happened to be, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Doing his job, by the way. And Bale has since apologized for that outburst. And by all accounts, he seems to be like a really good person. <laughs> in oh, normal yeah? I don't know. Did he, did he apologize? I didn't hear that he apologized. Yeah, he did. Okay. Yeah, he did. I want you off the set, you I'm sorry. No, don't just be sorry. Think for one f***ing second. What the, the f*** are you doing? Are you professional or not? Yes, I am. I was out of order beyond belief. I was way out of order. I acted like a punk. I regret that. And there is nobody that has heard that tape that is hit harder by it than me. Just don't treat people like that, especially when you're in a position of, you know, like Christian Bale, you're the star of the movie, and, you know, you're going to pick on this poor guy. It's just... But, I mean, that's just a situation where you're dealing with a film star, the star of the production. Right. And in the case of Harrison Ford, he does not really need to tolerate any sort of irritation or aggravation from someone who is on the set basically as a tech um, in his eyes. Now, sure. I think Tim Rose is an artist. I think he's a talent. But – 
he was there to move the, um, the, 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 the beak, <laughs> the, <laughs> the latex creatures around, you know, yeah, yeah. And, to, and to a guy like Harrison Ford, he's not going to, um, show the same amount of leeway to someone that he's looking on the set as, as somebody who could be easily replaced in his opinion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he didn't even know who he was yelling at. No, he didn't know. He just, he, you know, he he just he's yelling. I mean, the, the scene of him just yelling, because those guys were like all like, you know, hidden. And some of them were mm-hmm. in, in, uh, under the floor and all this. And you, you just picture Harrison just yelling at this, uh, sea of latex puppets. All right. Which one of you did it? Which... <laughs> and, you, and it's like, Reese, yeah. Efont Man, <laughs> Salacious Crumb. They're all just like looking at him. With I think Billy D stare. was back there, actually. Was it, uh, was it his uh, Skiff Guard character yeah. back there at one point? In was that, it you, uh, Williams? Reveal? Was it you? No, uh, Harrison. It would be cool. <laughs> cool it, Harrison. Cool it. Like I chill out. You. Cool it. <laughs> and uh, Harrison's losing his mind. Yeah. Well, that's, you... that's a good one. I, I hadn't heard that story. I don't think that made the. Uh, the creature uh, special. Oh my God. If there's footage special. of that, that would be great. If there is footage of that, please. <laughs> <laughs> Harrison standing there in costume, yeah. you know, fresh out of the carbonite block, <laughs> pointing at Jabba in his, the denizens of his palace, all yeah. those alien creatures yelling at him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Well, we've got a Why great show. Why is Greedo here? Why is Greedo here? Didn't I ice I, that guy? Took care of him two movies ago. <laughs> he knows all their names. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, of course. In this fantasy, he does. All right, we've got a great show this week. Rebel Force Radio for uh, June seventh, two thousand nineteen. Uh, joining us coming up later in the program, we've got Steve Sansweet, the Grand Poobah, there at Rancho Obi Wan, and Steve recently, very recently. Uh, took in a uh, experience there at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So, wow. Uh, last week, we had our pal David Sparks, Max Sparky, giving us his narrative as he walked through the uh, the whole uh, goings on there at Galaxy's Edge. Well, Steve is going to tell us his tale. And, of course, I'm sure that the topic of uh, collectibles and merchandise and souvenirs is going to come up. Uh, with Steve. So it'd be great to check in with him. Uh, also, we're still going through all of that information about episode nine that was uh, in the latest issue of Vanity Fair. Uh, we've got some photos that we didn't get to that we want to talk about and see what they might reveal uh, about the upcoming film. And of course, the end of the Skywalker saga. But we wanted to make sure that we got to some voicemails here. So uh, let's go with. Uh, Ben from Rochester. Take it away, Ben. Ben! <laughs> hey, this is Ben from Rochester. Um, just listening to last week's show where you guys were going over the uh, the big unveiling of Galaxy's Edge and everybody, uh, you know, Lando and Luke and Han and, uh, you know, that old guy. Who's that guy? George. Um, you know, and starting up the Falcon. And uh, Harrison Ford. Just revving it and, and, and saying, you know, hey, Peter, this one's for you. And it got me right in the feels. And I know, you know, uh, crying in Star Wars, that's been a big talking point for you guys or a couple months ago anyway. And, and uh, man, that one that one choked me up. I haven't looked at anything. I was waiting for you guys to, you know, go over the the opening and and, uh, and how how it went. Uh, I actually paused it, so I don't know what everyone's thoughts are on it yet, but I, I had to I had to pause it and call you guys because that that moment where uh, Harrison Ford calls out to Peter and says that one's for him, uh, it got me right right in the old gut. So uh, <laughs> you guys are doing great. I you know, I look forward to listening to you every week. May the force be with you and thank you so much. Well it was really an excellent moment when you have Mark, George, Harrison and Billy D all standing there in front of the Millennium Falcon. It really brings it all back. Let's uh, play that moment when Harrison actually dedicated the opening of Galaxy's Edge to the late, great Peter Mayhew.
Uh, this, this is just a little embarrassing. Is there somebody who knows how to fix this thing? She may not look like much, <laughs> but she's got it where it counts. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Harrison Ford. <laughs> All right. Can you uh, help us out with this thing? I'll give it a try, Bob. <laughs> Peter? This one's for you. There it is. All right. The Disney Parks blog uh-huh. has the complete video mm-hmm. uh, there on their YouTube channel, and uh, I think that's accessible via their website also. Let's do another voicemail. That was a great voicemail from... Uh, I-, I have to skip Curtis because he left us four messages. Um so, Curtis, uh, call us back and put it all into uh, one. That would be great. Yeah, keep them to about hey guys, two or three minutes. From Louisville. I'm sitting here currently listening to this week's episode, and I'm listening to the, well, it's really just a horror story of trying to get the uh, sticker off of the Grand Moff Tarkin <laughs> action figure. Oh. Please, in the name of all that is uh, holy, <laughs> don't pour liquids onto your action figures. It's, there's just no way that you're not going to ruin your package. I know everyone says goo gone and all that stuff works, but it's so easy. You just take a hair dryer and you put it on the hottest setting and you blow it on the sticker for a few seconds and you can peel the corner of it up and just keep blowing it on there as you're pulling the sticker off a little bit at a time. It's going to burn your fingers probably because the hot, you know, the air is pretty hot. It's worth but, it though. You know, if you do that, it literally takes like 15 seconds and you'll get the whole sticker off with no residue. Just uh. make sure you do not aim the hot hair dryer at the plastic bubble that's holding the figure. Oh, that's it bad. might make the bubble come off or warp. Yeah. But uh, just some heat and some, mm-hmm. um, I mean, if you don't mind getting a little singed on the no, fingertips. No, it's, it's cool. It'll it's be cool. done in 15 seconds. You'll have a nice, clean card. Please don't pour liquids on your action fixes. Oh, please, Rich. Don't pour, please. Yeah. Rich sounds please. very concerned. <laughs> Please don't do it. <laughs> like for all now, it's holy. All right, uh, okay, I do have to. I do have to uh, uh, amend uh, what I what I said last week when we were talking about the 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 mishap of of, of me trying to get the sticker off of the Grand Moff Tarkin uh, retro vintage action figure that comes with the Escape from the Death Star game. Um, after we wrapped up the show. I started thinking, I'm like, why in the world? Because I had threatened that I was going to try to take it back, return it, because I wanted it on card. And I thought right. to myself, why would I do that? I was looking at my shelf of uh, my own vintage figures from my childhood that I have gone through the process of kind of cleaning up, restoring a little bit, doing a little touch-up paint here and there. And I thought, I was just saying to Jim how cool it would be to have the, the this retro vintage Tarkin on a shelf with my vintage figures and see how well he blends in. And I'm like, well, that's what I'm going to do. So I opened my first uh, three and three quarter inch action figure in years. Felt very odd. And uh, and now I have him uh, right next to uh, Darth Vader. I think I put it up on Instagram on the Rebel Force Radio Instagram account. So you can see that. And he he looks great. He looks like Mm. he's needed to be there all along, which he has. So I didn't try to rip off Target. Well, that's, <laughs> oh, that's right. You were going to rip them off. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is clearly um, the Mr. Gugon segment mm-hmm. of – because I am Mr. Gugon, according to my local Target employees. And uh, I've had various uh, amounts of success with the Gugon. I did get the complete run of the vintage figures. What? You found them? No. My friend Barry found them. Barry and who? Barry Harmon. You uh-huh. know Barry. Uh, he's <laughs> always looking out for you, isn't he? Who's been on the show defending that line of action figures from the beginning, saying that he wanted them? And who was the guy that wanted nothing to do with them? I didn't say, the well, time? I just... Yeah, I, you did. Yeah, you did. I was weirded out. I didn't say I didn't want anything to do with him. Um, I am and, paraphrasing. And you have to understand, Barry goes to all the like the targets and Walmarts that I would typically go to. I don't care. So he's, he's getting my stuff before me anyway. So, well, all right. Oh, I'm just, if saying, I didn't have Barry, know, I, would, I would have bought it. 
I would buy it if I didn't have Barry. Yeah, I would. I would too if I could find the damn things. So anyway, did you use the Goo Gun? I did on the Leia, and it came out perfectly. Perfect. Really? Even and putting I, liquids on yes, the card. Yes, putting liquids on the card, and the, the liquids it comes up real easily, and it takes away all the sticker residue with it. But then I tried it on the Han. And that didn't go so well. Ooh, what yeah, so I, yeah, that ripped the card a couple times. Yeah. Other people have suggested lighter fluid. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. And now with the hair dryer suggestion, which of course is going to cause all kind of controversy in my house when I walk into the bathroom and the family hears the, the hair dryer fire up. I was hoping be- you would do it right now, live on the air. Oh, but we could actually. Should we try to do it on the <laughs> let's, air? Let's try it. Let's see what happens. All right, give me give me one minute. I'll okay. be right back with a hair right. dryer in the studio. I, Which I'll figure are you going to use? Which one should I use? Uh, Darth Vader. Vader. Yeah, yeah. Vader. Well, yeah. Okay. He's going to bring right. the heat. All right. Give me right. give me one minute. I'll All be right. right back. So Jimmy Mac is going to go off and retrieve his retro vintage action figure secured for him by uh, that turncoat Barry Harmon, um, who we can see where his loyalties lie. As he uh, looks out for Jimmy Mac, because Jimmy Mac doesn't have enough action figures. Whatever. Anyway, I'll find them sooner or later. They're going to go to uh, the distribution of these figures is going to open up to uh, all the different uh, retailers, I believe. The Target just got the early, uh, you know, dibs, I guess. So they were in the stores from May the 4th on through... Now they're uh, actually ringing up as discontinued. Go figure that. You know, if you you didn't even find the things, and now they're discontinued. That's a way to make your collector fans excited. But I'm sure that, in fact, I think maybe Entertainment Earth and Big Bad Toy Store, they might be taking pre-orders for them already or will be soon. So they'll be more uh, more prevalent, I'm sure. But at any rate, we've got um, Jimmy Mack. He's going to be doing a live de-stickering of a Hasbro vintage retro action figure. And that sticker, again, I, you know, not to beat a dead wampa, but, I mean, we're talking about two, two and a half inches in diameter. It's just a huge sticker. It complete. I mean, it's one thing to put, like, a little sticker up in the corner or down. But this sticker just is so ridiculously oversized for what it's intended to do and the artwork's not good it's just a mess i think jimmy might be back i think back. Uh, does he have a does he have a hair i have dryer? a hair dryer okay all right yes it's a, a are you are you ready to feel the burn the pain well we'll see you gonna suffer I'm... for your uh your hobby I have pretty high pain tolerance, obviously. Mm. I talk to you every week, so. Well, yeah, that'll um, do it. That'll do it. Okay, I got to put it on. High. This okay. is a, a Vidal Sassoon hair dryer. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it has an, a, a switch on the top that says Ion Switch. Ion. Like Ion Cannon. Oh, well, uh, that must be the one. Should I, put it, should I turn it on or uh, off? Yeah, full Ion know. power. Yeah. All right, yeah. we're doing Ion power yeah. here. Yeah. Okay, I have the settings on hot. Yeah. And I'm going to turn it on high. Um, we're going to do 15 seconds here. So you tell me when to stop, all right? All right. And the, the trick is don't get the bubble. So I have to yeah, figure out you, you how to, to really effectively. Go away from the bubble. Uh, blowing away from the bubble. Okay, yeah. doing that now. And uh, are we ready? Yeah, yeah we're ready. Okay. Right. Go for it. No. Give me a punch it. Oh, okay. All right. Three, <laughs> two, one. Punch it. Huh? All right. All right. The bubble is not melting. Okay. The card, I feel the card getting warmer in my hand. Uh-huh. All I'm you need applying to, do is to get a corner up. All right. I'm only oh only a corner yeah, of it? Yeah, stop, 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 oh, stop. Oh, hold on, stop. hold on. I can't find the off button. Yeah. Oh, it's all melting. No, it's no. not. <laughs> okay, right. so the, the card okay. is very warm right now. Okay. Now did you were you really <laughs> aiming it at the sticker? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, right on top. All right. Now, see if you can peel up a corner. Good. Feel up if you see if you can peel up a corner. All you need is just a little. Well, it's a round sticker, so there's no corner. But you know what I mean. An edge. Get an edge up. Trying to get an edge here. Get an edge on life. Uh, get the sticker on. It's peeling it up with my fingernail. Yep. 
Yeah. Can it's, you get a start? Um, yeah, I got a start, but it's not like just coming right up. Like, All right, more heat, more heat. Color said, hold on, hold on. We're getting somewhere here with the thumbnail a little bit. All right, here we go. Because you need We're to get that edge up so that you can then position the hair dryer so that it's blowing underneath the sticker. That's the goal. Underneath? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, it's no, it's it's not that easy right now. This is not working out as more well heat. as I anticipated. More heat. All right, I'm trying more heat now. Yeah, more heat. Yeah. You should, yeah. Don't want to blow a fuse down here. Here we go. All right. uh, applying you. heat now. Uh huh. Yeah. On the this corner. Is for you, Rich. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. This also you know, we will really be... want to work the sticker. You know, in in you didn't want to start from the edge and kind of move inward. But we really okay. want to work the edge so that we can get a, a, a lift. Oh wow, the card is getting very hot now. Yeah. The bubble is still safe. That's good. You could probably throw like a t shirt or a towel or something over the bubble. To sort well, of I'm just not deflect very some of that heat. I'm kind of pointing away from it. Yeah. It's not too hard to do. All right, all right. Let's 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 try it again. Let's try it again. Let's see if we can get an edge right. lifted off of this thing. Interesting. Oh wow, the the card is really burning hot. Right. Ow! Very, yes. Yep. See, he said this would hurt. It is. It's coming right up. Okay. All right, but don't. Okay, so more than fifteen. As, more than fifteen seconds. Yeah. And as soon as you feel any resistance on that tug, you got to get the hairdryer back. Back in it. And All right, here we under, go. Underneath the sticker. Okay, hold on. Oh, Gosh, this is the, like the, the my hair so All right, here oh, we go. Is, okay. All right, we'll also be doing perms and manicures later in the show. <laughs> here we go. All right, that sticker. Card, once again, the card is really starting to heat up. Yeah. Yeah, but you want to get underneath that sticker. You want to dry up that adhesive. This is a big step for Mr. Gugon to be taking here. Yeah, the Gugon guy. The Gugon guy. And this is honestly taking a lot longer than I thought it would. So it's okay. I'm going to power down. Uh-huh. I'm going to power down, and, and we'll see what happens here if, the, if I don't feel like. Pulls? Yeah, it's it's coming off of there. There is a distinct layer of adhesive still on the card. And slowly but surely, the sticker is coming up with little resistance okay there we go there's a little bit of um it just looks like the first layer of the sticker is now coming up so i'll tell you what this this does appear to be a pretty effective way to do it okay it does leave there is like i said a distinct layer of adhesive still on the card you can see it it's oh, a circle yeah, residue okay. all right I was so the coupon that. The goo gone might come into play. Well, for that, I would I would really use the lighter fluid. I I really think that. Oh, that's, that's right, the lighter play, fluid. Yeah. I have not tried that one yet. I heard um, applying lighter fluid on Q-tips specifically yes. is a good balls. way. To, but, mm-hmm. Because I did try a paper towel with the Tarkin, and it left uh, little tiny white specks on oh, a part of the card. Yeah. Okay, so well, this is uh, appearing to be pretty effective. Okay, I, you know, um, it's it's probably going to take several more minutes for me to uh, keep working this with the hair dryer and uh, patiently pulling the sticker back. But um, yeah, that's a good tip. That's uh-huh. a good tip, and uh, it, it 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 is working. It is working. But I think we spent it's enough working. time. It's <laughs> working. It's working. So, thank well, you. thank you very thank much. You. So th- there you go for all you uh, yeah. collectors out there who might be scouting out the targets uh, in the men's clothing section while you're looking for uh, your your action figures. That's a good tip. Um, yeah. Get the hair dryer out. It does ease with the removal of the sticker. But I do believe I'll be uh, applying some uh, Goo Gone or lighter fluid. Yeah. I'll go with the lighter fluid just because I haven't tried that yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's a lot uh, this- cheaper than the Goo Gone. Oh, is it? Well, you know, like the Zippo lighter fluid. It's not, not very expensive. I see. You get quite a bit of it. Great. So, well, thank yeah. you so much for the tip on that. Yes, Rich, yeah. Louisville. Um, but let's get into, uh, let, let, let's wrap up our coverage of the Vanity Fair preview. Let's do that. We'll let's do that. I'm going to finish news. my hair. I have good news for you, my lord. That's 
Good news. Come closer, I have good news. All right, so if you've been listening to the show the last couple of weeks, we have been dissecting uh, piece by piece, article by article, uh, the coverage of Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, as featured in uh, Vanity Fair. And uh, we haven't had a chance to talk to or talk about these great photos from uh, Annie Leibovitz that were uh, featured in the um, the floppy issue, as well as uh, some that were online. And the first one is really no surprise. We saw this uh, in the trailer. Uh, this is Ray um, on the, the desert planet, which we know is not Tatooine, and we know is not Jakku, and we know it is not Batu, right? Because people are... Uh, Hanging out in Batu right now, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Doesn't look like Batu. Um, what is the name? I, you know what? That was revealed in these articles. And I it's a completely Passana. About it. Passana. Passana. Yeah. yeah. At first I thought it said Pasadena. And I'm like, oh, that's not very exotic. <laughs> but Passana. <laughs> so I started, I'm like, oh, pass on what you've learned. Passana. Oh. I don't know if that's what they intended. <laughs> yeah, there's some innuendo there. Innuendo. But so we, we've got... Um, We've got Daisy Ridley as Ray, kind of standing there. It looks like she's just kind of getting, uh, I don't know, just like getting like a, a, a beauty shot or, uh, uh, you know, like a production continuity photo or something taken of her. She's just standing there. So not much to say other than that's a really beautiful uh, uh, part of the world that they're in. Some really, it's very Star Warsy, of course, you know, desert Star Wars go together. But these beautiful mountains in the background looks very, very nice. It looks very much like Tunisia. Um, especially mm. when you get to the second photo for me, where we've got uh, Anthony Daniels and the umbrella guy. I would like someone to interview all the people <laughs> that have made a career out of holding an umbrella over top Anthony Daniels as he is inside the three PO costume. This has been going on since '76. I'm going to be cosplaying at Star Wars Celebration Anaheim as the umbrella guy. Mm. I just need a three PO. Maybe do. we'll just walk around. Maybe you know, just to make it easy on everyone, I'll use a three PO action figure <laughs> and a little cocktail umbrella, and oh, I'll just hold it over that. You know, perfect. So that perfect. way, you know, I'm I'm not drawing too much attention to myself. It's like you know, people will be like, "Who's he supposed to be? The penguin?" Yeah, you know, no, no, no. I'm umbrella guy from the deserts. Don't you recognize me from the Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan? <laughs> Perfect. Well, you know, when we saw the trailer, one of the things we remarked about uh, regarding 3PO, Jim, was that he's a, he looks very uh, Return of the Jedi 3PO. Mm -hmm. He's very shiny, but he has kind of this sort of matte shine look. So I should say he looks very clean, um, but it's not quite the uh, the super, super shine that we saw in Episode 3. Right. Um, it's, it, it just feels more like Return of the Jedi to me. Here's something I never noticed. Um, the shoes. Have you ever noticed the 3PO shoes before? I have. Okay. They're, they're, they're clearly rubber and they don't really match mm. the rest of the, uh, of, of the suit. So the suit is uh, very much like a, a, a shiny gold mm -hmm. and you've got basically like a, like a rubber latex slipper. I've never really paid much attention to it like that before. I've always that? felt like the, well, I mean, I do now that you've planted that because you called it a shoe for starters. I've always <laughs> looked at it as three PO's foot. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, yeah, if we're pulling back the curtain all the way. <laughs> yeah. I'm breaking the, I'm really breaking he's, the fourth wall here. Well, He's not walking around with metal shoes that right. I know. That's true. Yeah. And what I do notice is uh, I always, for some reason, look at those exposed wires in 3PO's torso. Yeah. And if you look in the, if you look at A New Hope, it's just a real mess of wires, just a whole ton of wires. It's just a mess and things are popping off and breaking and everything. And it kind of maintained that look in Empire as well. But then when you got to Return of the Jedi, all the wires were super straight and like well organized and stuff, you know, like look great. <laughs> Yeah. And then, w w again, when we get introduced to him in um, the prequels, it's similar to that, but not as many wires as I've noticed in, say, A New Hope and Empire. Now we're looking at him out there on the desert, and it looks like just a minimal of wires. Not I mean, many wires at all. I mean, 
you know, before it used to look like my entertainment center in my family room. Now it just looks like, you know, maybe we have an Xbox plugged into uh, a little TV somewhere. You know, it's not that many wires. Right, right. It's uh, it's really not. And uh, he's, you know, maybe, you know, as with age, he's cutting back. I don't know. Um, but there, maybe uh, he's just he's you know it's just maybe there's Bluetooth involved and he's going more wireless. This is the future. Uh, we're you know about. it is uh, of the future a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I tr- attempted to ask Anthony Daniels about the inconsistency with these torso wires <laughs> when he was here in Chicago. You were with me, Jason, oh, and yeah. he, I remember he didn't even want to humor that question. <laughs> he thought it. I mean, like. What a comic book store guy question to be asking the great Anthony Daniels. He right. didn't want to have anything to do with that question. No, he, didn't I think he, he didn't even know there were wires. In that uh, no, I kind of think that. it's something that he's had the field in the past. And just after all these years, he had said to himself, he's not going to be addressing such ridiculous <laughs> observations that are so nitpicky. You know, <laughs> you know? Speaking of 3PO, um, I don't think you were around. I think you might have been, uh, you know, I don't know, in the restroom or maybe going to get ice in the hotel. But you're Bill blow and drying I, my hair. Maybe blow drying the hair. But Bill and I, uh, this is at Celebration Chicago. We, we we shared a room, Billy Mac and myself, uh, as Jim had the sort of the rotating bed, uh, you know, between his boys, um, and we were watching Return of the Jedi, and the scene where. 3PO, you know, he's in servitude to Jabba the Hutt. He's his translator droid. And, you know, Boosh comes in with Chewie and he gets real up. Jabba gets real upset and he he knocks 3PO down. Mm-hmm. And 3PO comes up and he's covered in the brightest green sludge you can possibly imagine. It's almost like glow in the dark fluorescent green. And nowhere on Jabba is anything that looks remotely like that. So Bill and I started to speculate. You know, Java <laughs> seems to be covered more in sort of a an earthy tone slime. Yeah, yeah. And so, we're, we, you know, we're spitballing here, trying to figure out why they went with this. And we, we figured that they probably started with the legit Jabba slime. And it just wasn't showing on that on that gold costume. And so, you know, they just kept getting brighter and brighter and brighter until it finally showed on camera. And then all of a sudden... You got, and what reminded me is in this photo, you got like a little uh, green X of, of of tape or something there that you know is his spot that he has to hit his mark uh, in the in the filming, and it looked like kind of the same shade of green as that Jabba slime. The, I mean, even the, the 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 frog floating in the goo like that. There's nowhere in Jabba's well, palace is anything remotely as green as that slime that ends up on three PO. Maybe it came out of his nose. Who's Jabba's and he just right before he hit 3PO you didn't see but he just kind of like rubbed his nose and he had snots on his nose well he's constantly got snot running out of his nose but it's this uh kind of brownish I don't know and yeah, well we listen we never see where 3PO actually lands because he falls <laughs> behind Jabba's throat. so again maybe uh, he landed okay on the hot dog condiment table and landed face first in the relish. It was relish all along. It was relish all along. Okay. Well, we'll have to notify Billy Mac because he and I both were uh, really dumbfounded by that. Yeah. You think it would come from Jabba hitting him, but it might come from a substance he landed in behind Jabba's throne. Who knows what's behind Jabba? Well. Ugh. I don't even want to think yeah, about it. I don't it. want to think about it either. All right. We've got another photo here. Here's uh, director J.J. J. Abrams. Um, with stunt coordinator Eunice Huthart, Huthart, and uh, we've got the Knights of Ren guys here. So we're finally seeing the Knights of Ren outside of a flashback. Uh, we can really take a look at uh, these uh, these characters. And what are you noticing, Jim? Is there anything that jumps out at you other than the fact that it's a real mishmash hodgepodge? These guys, these are not these look like guys that just picked up pieces and bits and baubles from all over the galaxy and assembled them, you know, into this, uh, these, these, these costumes and nothing's organized. Nothing is, uh, you know, matches. Seem no, like. right. The, the, yeah, they, they seem, it all seems very individualized. Uh, 
very customized, uh, I assume, for whatever their specialties are. Um, the first thing I noticed in this picture is J.J. Uh, Abrams. He looks like he's dressed up to go to a Dave Matthews concert circa 1995. <laughs> oh, look, I embrace. Uh-huh. I'm, uh-huh. You, know, you can find many pictures of me uh, kind of uh, <laughs> donning the same look. <laughs> the cargo shorts. Yeah. Uh-huh, and the zip-up hoodie and the T-shirt. The shade. the shades. Beer. I think, God, that does look, kind of look like Jimmy Mack there a little bit. Wow. So, yeah. It's, except when you get into the wallet area. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the similarities fade away. Now, what do I notice about these Knights of Ren? Uh, I think we talked about it briefly when we uh, first looked at these photos. Um, the staff there is um, that one of the Knights are holding is a staff that we see in Dryden Voss's collection in Solo. Um, Which one? The guy there on the right? Well, you see the tall staff. Um, no, not the guy on the right. He's the guy with his back to us. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, and I'm not even sure if he's the one holding this staff necessarily, but it oh, is yeah. the same staff from Dryden's collection. Um, other weaponry that these guys are holding, it's... Uh, one guy looks like he's holding a very large machete, mm-hmm. and um, he has a blaster of some sort. It almost looks like the blaster is an extension of his arm. It doesn't That's look what like I was thinking, yeah, like he's missing a hand, and this is, yeah. or maybe it's just the way he's holding this weapon. But it almost looks as if his forearm kind of becomes this blaster, this this nozzle. I mean, you don't see his hand, mm-hmm. and just the way that it kind of connects to his elbow almost well it's hard to tell it might just be a matter of perspective just how we're looking at the shot now Um, i'm wondering if these knights of ren if if what we're looking at with their costumes you know could these be remnant pieces and parts that they found on uh stormtroopers various types of uh, imperial troops uh the the fellow with his back to us i'm i'm because it's almost like just a uh, a domed head with the with the cape going down i'm just it almost looks like an imperial guard from the back who's yeah. had uh you know who's who's all in black yeah there's there's something just like very worn about these guys oh, yeah. goth um <laughs> St- <laughs> almost well yeah almost borderline steampunk in in a way yeah. oh yeah um the one guy on the left, it looks like he's almost wearing like a black Praetorian guard helmet. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if these guys are rejects from the Praetorians or, or something, um, or they're not rejects from the Praetorians, but like the exceptional elite warriors. Um, what I can tell you is I don't foresee these guys showing any sort of dark side abilities or any force abilities at all. Mm. And I only say that just by judging from their weaponry. They seem to be using more traditional weapons of war as opposed to the Jedi lightsaber, or the Sith lightsaber, what have you. Yeah. Um, what do you notice about these guys? Well, pretty much everything that you have said. I mean, I, I, what, I, what I'm trying to do is – like you, I'm looking at a piece, whether it be the the, the breath mask of one character, uh, you know, the tunic, the belts. I'm looking at all these things and saying, all right, have we seen this before? Is this is this uh, sort of the, you know, the garage sale flea market pickups that they have found or what they've scavenged? That's what it feels like to me. It's just scavenged. But what I'm, I'm more interested in when it comes to the Knights of Ren is the fact that um, – you know, they were arguably shortchanged so far in the sequel trilogy. Now, we'll see what happens with episode nine. But we, you got Kylo Ren. He takes his name. His very name is from the Knights of Ren. Uh, or he gives his name to, you know, these. Yeah. Th- th- well, these no, knights. obviously. But, the Knights but, of Ren. I mean, the, 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 right. the, he's the, Kylo the title. Ren. Right. Yeah, the title says exactly what they are. The, the Knights of Ren. They serve Kylo they Ren. They serve Kylo Ren. Matt, but 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 Snoke, you know, he's using that um, you master of the Knights of Ren. You know, he, that, like as if that's some sort of uh, honor. You know that he took his place as mm-hmm. the master of the Knights of Ren, as if the Knights of Ren were there. 
and then Kylo became Kylo Ren. Like, uh, you know, the, the, maybe Ren is sort of like for Snoke what Darth is for yeah. Sidious in a sense. Okay, know? yeah, 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 yeah. And maybe there's some history there before Kylo took the... Took the Ren, the yeah. you know, I mean, because they haven't really been designated necessarily as Sith thus far. We've been told Kylo Ren's not a Sith. Yeah. But clearly... They're an extension of the Sith, and if you're going to somehow incorporate Palpatine into this story, then they're more than extensions of Sith. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, we'll have to see how that all shakes right. out. But that is one of the big mysteries going into M9 is uh, the Knights of Ren. How do they fit in the story? Who are they? And what is their ultimate purpose? In the article, it says they're elite, fearsome enforcers of Kylo Ren's dark will. But I mean, yeah, I think we already knew that just by the, their title, Knights of Ren. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we, we knew they carry out what his orders are, but how do they fit into all of this? Right. Especially- now my question is like, you know, it's like chicken or the egg. What came first, the yeah. Ren or the Kylo? Right, right. No, that's that's a fair question. Again, I don't see these guys displaying force abilities necessarily. I agree. They, they just look too grungy. Like the relationship with the Imperial Guards to Palpatine or the Praetorian Guards to Snoke. I think the Knights of Ren fit that personal bodyguard position as yeah. far as yeah, as far as their relationship with Kylo and everything. Mm-hmm. But you're right, Snoke does indicate that it is something of a particular honor for Kylo to be considered the leader of the Knights of Ren. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was something that he leaned on. And I thought, well, that's interesting that they never kind of went back to that. Um, Here's another photo we've got. This was a big reveal. This was Carrie Russell, great actress, um, playing the masked scoundrel Zori Bliss. And this this is, uh, according to the caption, seen in the thieves quarters of the snow dusted world. Kajimi. Kajimi Mac, maybe. Yeah, right. Kajimi? There's, I don't know. Oh, I got a planet named after me now. <laughs> I'm getting a distinct Zam Wessel vibe from her a little bit. I don't well, know why. I mean, why pur- am I getting that? Purple. Purple. The purple. There you go. The purple. And, you know, uh, she's a female bounty hunter, apparently. So yeah, Double blasters, w- looks like, maybe. Yeah, we don't know for a fact that she is a bounty hunter, per se. I think she is. Masked scoundrel. But she's definitely an underworld character. And uh, there's a, a coolness factor to Zori Bliss in both the name and the look. So, and I like Carrie Russell too. So, um, this seems to be a, a win-win for Episode Nine. I think um, uh, should the character be mysterious and effective, then I think that Zori Bliss could be, you know, maybe the the new Boba Fett of. Episode nine. Who who knows? Now, this is the first time we've seen Carrie Russell's character, a photo of Carrie Russell's character. If you notice the helmet, it kind of goes back uh, a ways. Now, we don't know if she's playing a human looking character. I mean, you know, I would so, imagine she. So but but what do you think? What do you make of that helmet? Why are that helmet be thrust back like that? I'm okay. thinking, is it making room for the? You know, she's got great hair. Is it making room for that hair? Is it making room from you know for some tendrils? Could she? No. I don't know. What? There's got to be a reason for it. I feel like maybe it's just an aesthetic thing, just to make it look exotic for the Star Wars universe. It, it looks kind of. People have said has a Rocket Man look to it. I was it. just gonna say Rocketeer. Rocketeer. That's yeah. what I meant. Yeah, with the Elton John movie Rocket Man. <laughs> I... <laughs> I'm the Rocketeer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But um, also, you know, it's like if you look at uh, speed cyclists, they have helmets that sort of flare out the back as That's well. A, you know what? That's a great point. Who knows? She could she be might, riding some speeder. Speeder, a speeder yeah. bike or something like right. that. That would require her to have uh, a helmet wear that provides specific aerodynamic qualities. I don't know. Um, or it could just be just to make it look exotic. Yeah. Um, there's 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 a little bit of Egyptian stuff going on here with the uh, with the the forearm uh, covering mm-hmm. that she has there the the rings around the bicep and then the ornamental chest plate 
that goes around her neck. That all kind of seems very Egyptian to me. Yeah, good call there. Yes, for sure. Very influenced by that. And I don't know if those are, 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 are knives or swords or if those are bla- they look like blasters to me that are on her hips. Yeah, that does look like an unconventional kind of weapon, but they could be blasters in holsters. Right. And it's all very ornamental, again, like ancient Egypt. That's a very intriguing look at her character. First look yeah. at Zori Blitz is already uh, well, I'm intrigued. got me. Well, I want the action figure, so. Well, that's for sure. That's all you need to know. All right. Um, next, we have uh, General Hux, Domino Gleason. No big surprises there. But Richard E. Grant's character that we now know as Allegiant General Pride. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, those Star Wars names. Got to love it. Bliss, Pride, right? Yeah, perfect. Um, yep. And uh, there was speculation. We talked about this a couple of uh, shows ago there going into this, that Grant was going to play a you know father. Do you notice that every time a new character is in, you know, gets revealed in Star Wars, people go, oh, I bet or th- that that actor is going to be so and so's mom, oh, so and so's I mean- dad. We're, we're constantly looking for these family, uh, these bl- <laughs> these bloodlines, yeah. you know, we really well, are. In fairness, you know. It is a story about family, Star Wars. It always has been about a specific family and other families, too, I guess. So um, this would be the episode where those kind of relationships should get revealed and solidified. Um, So here you have uh, Grant, General Pride, Allegiant General Pride. What does that mean, Allegiant General? How does – I mean he's obviously – he's an Allegiant General. Um, but like what significance does the word allegiant have in his title? Um, why wouldn't he just be first order general pride? What's right. allegiant? What is this? Is this some like faction of the first order? Well, you know, you is... do have like moth and then grand moth. So I wonder if this yeah, just... I get me. It's just like a made up kind of uh, <laughs> accolade for him. And also, you know, with the the way this picture is shot it looks like a father son photo. It really <laughs> you know, does. Yeah. Dad sitting in the chair, son standing behind, mm-hmm. both sharing the evil stare that's been passed down generations. But again, his last name's Hux and his last name's Pride. So we don't necessarily have any sort of family. I, I predict they're going to be more rivals. They're, you yes, know, that's they're, a vibe they're... I can get from this photo a little bit. Yeah, yeah there's a rivalry. Now, notice. What is Richard E. Grant holding? Looks in like his a hands? baton. It's got something in his lap. Is it like a baton? I or think something? it's like a baton, See? like a dictator baton. He's going to go yeah. smacking people behind the knees with it. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's my prediction for these two guys: is that they're going to be butting heads in an effort to uh, both w- control their slice of the first order pie and win the acceptance and approval of Kylo Ren, who I'm assuming will be the supreme ruler at this point because he was at the end of The Last Jedi. Well, now we get a, a series of some photos here of what we, we see in the tr- in the teaser trailer. It looks like this is... There's a, there's a moment in the teaser where you've got 3PO and Poe, and I think Chewie's in there, and they're, they're on some sort of a uh, skiff or some sort of desert terrain moving vehicle you know what i'm talking about yeah 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 and this brief looks- shot it looks like some sort of desert chase is happening yes yes so this looks like maybe this is them uh, getting ready for that again umbrella guy's there umbrella guy we see finn and exactly. finn's got a new do we've seen the you know um some publicity shots of uh, john boyega's finn um he's also wearing uh, some killer pants like some uh some like mint or not mint green. I don't know what you would call that. Uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> it's it's some green blue. pants, Greedo green pants with uh, with the characteristic Star Wars stripe down the side and uh, some uh, some tan boots. Um, Daisy Ridley, uh, you know, God, I got to tell you, and I, we've had some feedback from uh, RFR listeners saying, what's up with Ray's costume? Why isn't it evolved at all? You know, Luke's, you know, look at the the tr- the original trilogy and even Anakin Skywalker in the uh, prequel trilogy, the, the costume evolved to show evolution of the character. Luke going from the, you know, white shorty robe to the, the, the black 
almost Vader like or Imperial like um, spin on the on the classic Alec Guinness uh, garb. And uh, Anakin also progressed and got darker and darker. Um, Ray's pretty much the same. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a little different interpretation, but variations on the same theme. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I am a little disappointed with the uh, lack of uh, uh, evolution yeah. for her look. Yeah. I would have figured by now she um, would have done anything she could to uh, forget her past life on Jakku, as opposed to wearing the same old duds that she was wearing on that planet when she was, you know, broke, poor, and, uh, you know, definitely under the thumb of a guy like Unkar Plutt. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think, you know, once you move away from that, you'd adapt to a different look. Um, In The Last Jedi, she had a different look. While it still had similar themes... Those, yeah, it hasn't really changed the, all that the much. Arm, the arm wraps. Mm-hmm. You know, once you get off the desert planet, I think the first thing you do is you take those arm wraps off. Oh, God. Yeah, right. Ooh, you know, let, let those uh, biceps <laughs> breathe a little bit. And she's not as wrapped up in this one. She, uh, The arm wraps only go up to her elbow for yeah. this one. It's not a full arm wrap. We'll but I just more never leather understood. trim on this, too. A little more trim of the sort of the brown leather. Yeah, um, I think now, obviously, the coloring, the the white and the uh, light beige in the wrappings. I mean, you get this great contrast. Ray represents the light. Kylo dressed all in black represents the dark. So I think in those terms... It's spot on, but the look is very derivative of the look she had in The Force Awakens. And like I said, I think that's part of her past that she would have moved beyond at this point. And I'm surprised we're not seeing her in more traditional resistance garb that we've seen some of the others wear. Now, if it came down to that... If she was going to wear like those tan resistance jumpsuits and stuff or dress her up like Rose Tico or something, I, I say stick with this Force Awakens look. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. a way it's a better look. And, and it's 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 part of her brand at this point. You know, you know who you're looking at when you look at Ray. When you go to Galaxy's Edge and you go into the gift shop and you see those Ray robes hanging there you just know instantly it's so identifiable so um as i hear myself talking about it and considering what the other options are uh i find myself actually becoming more and more attracted to this look for her you know i started with sitting going oh i wish they would have uh, evolved a little and then i thought about the directions in which her look could evolve and so eh, maybe just keep her wearing what she's been wearing. Yes. No, she don't looks mess good with swinging that. She still uses the staff. Yeah. So um, the light robes may uh, help her uh, with those attack moves she makes. So, uh, okay. I came around on that one pretty fast. All right. The next shot is uh, sort of the continuation of this and that now they're on uh, this sort of uh, th- this chase sequence as it's being credited in the in the. Uh, in the captions and you can see, you know, the, the sort of the engine of whatever this, this craft is now, we're obviously not, we're not going to see the wheels of it. This is not it's some sort of dune buggy that they're using in the real world to create this speeder. Uh, but the, it looks very much like the engine on the Luke's uh, speeder on Tatooine to me. Oh, it does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The speeder chase will probably be what's happening here. You know, same terrain. Um, it would make sense that they would be using technology similar to that of Tatooine. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll get some kind of uh, when we finally see whatever this uh, transport is that they're they're on during the chase. Uh, hopefully, it does kind of invoke some of those memories of Luke's land speeder on Tatooine and other vehicles we saw in Mos Eisley, et cetera. And uh, now this is something we've been looking at for a little while. Is uh, uh, Billy D. Williams as Lando wearing that mustard colored uh, Captain Kirk slash Gordon Gartrail slash uh, Donald, Donald Glover, Glover. <laughs> shirt. Um, I do like the cape. I love that uh, 
black with the with the sort of the greenish blue on the inside. It's looking looking nice. Um, and there he is on the in the cockpit of the Falcon with uh, Poe Dameron and his um, kind of Indiana Poe outfit that he's got going on. And there's uh, what is it, Rio? Dio. It's Dio, not Rio. <laughs> Dio is uh, peeking over his shoulder, and we got BB-8 peeking over the other shoulder, and Chewie in the background. Um, you know, I mean, we've seen three PO in a, in a couple of these shots. No R two yet. No, here's Dio yeah. and here's uh, BB-8. In fact, you know, uh, sitting right next to three PO in that uh, in the in the one shot is is BB-8, not R two D two. What's going on with R two D two these days? Yeah, uh, how did he get demoted the way he has? Well, he really got demoted. I mean, he was George Lucas's favorite character. <laughs> The cockpit shot is great, though. Uh, classic Annie Leibovitz. Um, it you know she always has shots like this mm-hmm. when she's on the set for these films, and uh, you know it's a very uh, jovial, loosey goosey nature. I've heard people say, "Why is Poe in the cockpit? The co-pilot seat in the cockpit, and Chewie standing behind Lando?" Is I, I think it's just a family portrait. <laughs> yeah, situation. I don't think this is like. A no. scene from the movie or anything. No, like no. And I have to say, I don't care what color shirt he's wearing. It is so great to see Billy D. Williams back in the role of Lando Calrissian sitting behind the controls of the Millennium Falcon. Oh, it's no just question. so perfect. If you can't have Harrison Ford there, Billy D. is the best uh, second banana you can think of. No, and, no kidding. Do, so. Is that a blaster that he has slung over his shoulder there? He's got kind of a, a shoulder yeah. holster that yeah. puts the blaster down at his hip. Clearly Inside. looks like that. You can see the, uh, you can see the blast. It looks like a silver blaster. Yeah. So he's like the Lone Ranger with the silver bullets, <laughs> uh, but he's Billy D as Lando. And so yeah, that's a good look. Um, I hope we get a moment where we see him take the blaster out and use it. <laughs> I want to see some action sequences with Lando in this film. He's been working out with Gunner for the last year and a half. I mean, let's see. Let's let's see the results of that. Let's see it. Well, he looks he's looking great. looking good. He looks fantastic. Yeah. Uh, all right. We've got another photo. Now, here is um, uh, Naomi Aki uh, playing Janna. Rumors are that she could be uh, a daughter of Lando Calrissian. Um, no confirmation of anything like that, but that has been uh, some speculation. And we've got uh, John Boyega's Finn, and they're riding atop these... Uh, these creatures, they, they, they're they called Orbacks, um, mm-hmm. not to be confused with Jerry Orbach. <laughs> right. I was wondering where I heard that name before. Great, great actor. Uh, rest in peace. Um, but these are, are horses. They, they, clearly, I think they used horses in the filming of these. Yeah. Um, and then they created sort of a, a CG face. But there's something between like a, a woolly mammoth and a horse. A lot of people are pointing out to um, Star Wars itself and saying that the face looks like that of a whippid. A whippid is an alien species that's spotted in Jabba's palace. Hmm. It's probably somebody Harrison Ford yelled at for laughing. <laughs> um, but the whippids, yeah, it's it's a background uh, alien species you can see in Return of the Jedi hmm. in Jabba's palace. And... Um, uh, there was a, a really well-known expanded universe character who was a whippet named Kruk, and he was from the comic books. Hmm. I believe the uh, whippet we see in Jabba's palace is named Jaquil. And um, I have to agree with people who have pointed this out online. Uh, I do definitely see the similarities in the uh, facial structure of the whippet alien from Return of the Jedi, when compared to these Jerry Orbacks from uh, <laughs> Episode Nine, there's there's a distinct. I mean, th- these look more horse-like, yeah, for sure, uh, with the the long muzzle and everything, uh, long snout, I should say. Um, but uh, I, I I see the similarities. I, I think it's the tusk. <laughs> it's the big giveaway. The two tusks. I also find it interesting to see. Naomi Ackley using um, bow and arrow, which Ooh. is something we haven't seen in Star Wars since Return of the Jedi with the Ewoks. Wasn't there? Uh, an, yes. The Ewoks right. definitely yeah. Um, yeah, were, for sure. 
using bow and arrow. So I wonder if we're going to be catching up with these characters, uh, Naomi, et cetera, um, if they live on like kind of a technically backward planet that hasn't really caught up with the rest of the Republic, you know, and she's like a tribesman and well, or something. The, the, you know, you right? know look at the look at the caption here. It says uh, Finn and new ally. Yeah. Janna atop Hardy Orbex lead the charge against the mechanized forces of the First Order. That sounds very Return of the Jedi to me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, where we're going to we're going to see the juxtaposition of the technological terror of the First Order against the, you know, less technical um like in the form of the Ewoks and Jedi and perhaps these this this force here. Um, we've got another shot of, uh, this, uh, speeder chase. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, also we've got some, um, uh, the, uh, natives of the, the planet Pasana. Um, and they look, uh, now these aren't the, the kind of the peach fleshy look that we're used to with the prequels. Um, they they definitely have their own vibe. These characters with uh, sort of these bulbous eyes, and then these um, I don't know what you would call these tentacles. Tentacles, yes, tentacles that kind of drip down as their lips or their mouths or whatever. Yeah, that's are. become the, the tentacle thing has really become an overriding quality for many of these alien species we've been introduced to in the Disney era. A lot These, of tentacles, huh? A lot of tentacles. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of odd, I think, um, that they really lean on that heavily. But, yeah, the tentacles is the way to go, I guess, with the uh, sequel era aliens. There is a weird one that looks like it's out of um, H.R. Puffin stuff or something. I, I can't I can't quite even decipher. It, it looks <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, like a furry thing with a w- weird weird goggles on. And yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't even know. It, it's almost as if you took a hammerhead and covered it with fur and removed its eyes and then gave it some sort of weird little mask goggle thing to look through. Yeah. And yeah. then you see there's there's actual humans among these aliens, yes. too. Yeah. So these dealing. The Aki, yeah. Aki. These are the natives of the planet Pisana. And uh, maybe maybe they are the you know the the less technologically advanced that will uh, take on the first order. Aki Aki, I think the Aki Aki are specifically the tentacled species here, and not the yes, human. Right, right, not the human. Aki Aki, Aki Aki, Giacomo Fino Anane, Giacomo Finane, Aki Aki. Hey now. Um, All right, Jimmy Mack was speaking in tongues there for a moment. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, from New Orleans specifically. Yes. Uh, all right, here we got a shot of uh, from uh, Episode 7, The Force. No, it's not. It's actually from Episode 9. It just looks like it's from Episode 7. This is Kylo Ren and Rey as they battle out with lightsabers in a stormy confrontation. Well, I mean, it's it's not snowy, but it looks kind of snowy. Yeah, I when, think when, that's... When you, but it's rain. It's rain. Is it rain or is it... Are they on that planet where they spotted the Death Star, uh, the remnants of the Death Star? Mm, you see that it, could the be. and it looked like you know maybe this is a wave splashing up around them. You know maybe uh, this is maybe ocean actually water. on that. That's yeah. Point. Maybe they're actually on that structure of the Death Star too. Now that's right. wild. I'm looking at some of the yeah, yeah okay as yeah, big waves cool. as big waves. Splash down on what would be the shoreline, <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, and 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 it sprays all around them. I think that would add an amazing dynamic to the saber duel. What I do want to see in this saber duel is some actual like choreographed saber fighting, and let the saber duel itself push the story forward because we haven't really seen that in the sequel trilogy at all. Like a real choreographed see i mean everything's yeah, choreographed of right. course you know, know what i mean, you mean. yes like, i know like, what you mean something a it little seems bit like more polished maybe you know focuses a little less on the characters maybe more on the 
technical aspect of sword fighting and and dueling that way, fencing, what have you, like what we saw in the prequels especially. And we saw, you know, in Empire Strikes Back, um, I never really felt like the saber duel in Return of the Jedi was about action. That was more about pushing the characters forward, pushing Mm -hmm. the story forward. I just want to see a saber duel that's rooted in the action of the actual activity of sword fighting. Because it feels like they're just slashing at each other until they can throw in some dialogue and then they slash at each other some more. It doesn't seem like they're really squaring off with each other. Like Darth Maul and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan experienced on Theed. Or even... um, Obviously, Anakin and Obi Wan in Return of the uh, Revenge of the Sith, that had everything riding on it. Mm -hmm. But still, we were able to get down and dirty with the saber duel itself and let the saber duel propel that moment of the film. Yes. Yes. What I see, like in The Force Awakens, the saber duel that happens in the forest is not much. It's just kind of like slashing and talking and slashing and talking. Um, which is ex- totally fine because it fits the story. Um, no saber duels at all in The Last Jedi. The showdown with the Praetorian Guards kind of was the placeholder for that, I think. But you don't have any legitimate saber duels happening in The Last Jedi. So I'd like to really see a barn burner here in Episode Nine that brings back the traditions that we've seen in previous Star Wars films of epic saber dueling, where the duel itself becomes the focus more than the internal angst of Kylo or the you know pleas of Rey or right. what you know, or Rey discovering herself and all that stuff. Let us just see them fight. <laughs> That's yeah. what I want. Let's see a fight. Now, there are a few other photos here. Um, we've got John Williams scoring the, uh, the music for Episode 9. And in the background, we can see as they're, as they're scoring to the, um, uh, you know, some, some of the film, uh, footage of the film. We've got Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher in the background. So this is clearly a scene that will uh, uh, feature her. We know that there are, is at least... One major scene where she uh, figures into it. Um, the the photo that's probably the most interesting to me of all. We did touch on this a little bit before, but this is uh, a brand new photo. It's been confirmed. This is new. This is not taken from the set of Episode Seven or Episode Eight. This is Episode Nine. Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker once again, looking as he does not on in the Battle of Crate, but as he's. Um, kind of got the uh, the long hair and the grizzled look of a Jedi in hiding, and he's surrounded by flames. And there's R two D two. So the only time we see R two D two at all in anything so far, I'm not drawing any conclusions. I'm just bringing this out is in what we can assume is a photo from a flashback. Mm, well. Or if it's it, it, it might not even be a photo at all. A lot of people have been complaining about the uh, efforts done in the Photoshop suite for this uh, particular photo. They're saying R2 is way too small. They're pointing out all kind of hangups with this photo. Um, R2, he does look a little small, doesn't he? Even Mark Hamill took to social media to say either I've grown or R2 is shrunk. Oh, really? Oh, when you have okay. You got Hamill, uh huh, online making comments. Okay, so this is a composite of some sort. It's a composite, and it's getting heavily criticized by people. Um, people are saying everything from, uh, you know, crappy work with the Photoshop to. False advertising. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, but nobody said that uh, these photos in Vanity Fair are canon. <laughs> nobody said that this is what we're going to see. I don't think we're going to see that shot of Lando, Poe, Chewie, Dio, and BB-8 in the Falcon cockpit together like that. I mean, that's a posed photo. This photo posed 
but then obviously tweaked heavily in Photoshop or what have you. And um, not done up to the uh, the standards mm-hmm. of a lot of online pundits who have been talking about it a lot lately. I'm going to pull up Hamill to see exactly what he said about it because I, I did notice right before we started the show – that he had something to say about it. He always says he's got the photo. He has a photo of himself in R2 that was shot back in uh, the mid-70s uh, there in the uh, desert in Tunisia. And R2 is clearly uh, well above Luke. They're standing together. And he's R2's dome clearly is well above Luke's belt line here. Mm. And then you see the second picture, which is this picture from Vanity Fair that we're talking about. And uh, there is R2 there, and uh, he is clearly well beneath Luke's belt line. And Mark says, then versus now, have I been growing taller over the years, or has R2 just been shrinking? You decide. Hashtag larger Luke theory. Hashtag diminutive droid theory. So... So he's uh, he's having a lot of fun with this. Um, I can point out um, a, a noticeable difference in uh, the picture Mark uses to provide scale. Uh, the picture he uh, has from uh, the original Star Wars shoot in the mid-70s features R2 on only two legs. Oh. So he's standing straight up. Meanwhile, the picture of in Vanity Fair of older Luke with R2 has R2 in the tripod positioning. And so, obviously, he is going to be a little bit smaller. Um, but uh, I, I do think that this is something that was pasted together on a computer as opposed to a legitimate shot of Luke standing with R2. Oh. And w- if Mark is commenting on it, yeah, then he knows he was there when he, the picture was taken. And so right. he, knows, he, he, he realizes R2 wasn't in the shot. Um, and so this was all done afterwards, yeah. but I, you know, I, I'm not going to jump all over this one and pick it apart. It makes it look like a flashback with the inclusion of R2 right next, right by at Luke's side. In the know? flames, you know, we know that the, in the flames, the Jedi, yeah, the, uh, temple or not temple, but the right. their camp uh, was the camp was, Jedi, the, the summer camp <laughs> that Luke was running. Um, but you know, it's um, camp. I don't want to be one. I think Luke will be appearing as a, you know, a force ghost. He's not presented as a specter in this shot. No. Um, but I, I think he will appear to Ray as uh, some sort of spirit in this film. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how um, flashbacks. Yes. Yes. But gosh, give us that force ghost. Why don't you? It's been too many movies. We went through the whole prequels with no Force goes. We've gone through two films of the sequel era with no Force goes. Bring them back. Bring back. Well, the- now we had Yoda. Oh, oh, you're right about that. We did have Yoda. Oh, you're you're ab- God. You're absolutely right about that. You're absolutely right about that. But we and, haven't you seen know, a human. We haven't seen you know, a human Force goes. No. Something I have been considering though is why Yoda says uh, to Luke. Missed you, I have, you know? It's like, well, why couldn't you just appear to Luke? Well, it's obvious because Luke had shut himself off from the Force. Right, right. I don't believe Force ghosts appear randomly to people. No. I think that the Force ghosts get summoned via a Force seance kind of situation where it can only appear to someone who is also strong in the Force. They can't like just show up and like, you know, taking a a pod race or a ball game or something. Yeah, you know, no, that's not happening. Yeah. No, no. It, they have to be summoned to the material world yeah. and their conduit is a strong force user. All right. Well, let's let's summon someone to our world right now. And that someone is uh, our good pal and a uh, friend of all Star Wars fans, Mr. Steve Sansui joining us in the cantina. Steve Sansui, Mr. Steve Sansui. Star Wars, Star Wars Cantina. Where are you going, Master? For a drink. Sorry about the mess. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello. Oh, there he is, Steve Sansweet from Rancho Obi Wan, fresh out of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. I was studying for my driver's exam. Oh, oh really? I have to get a new license, and uh, it's been ten years, so they're making me take the test. Mm-hmm. I really, the this. written test? The written test, yeah. Oh my goodness! Mm-hmm. Do they know I who do. you are? Yeah, don't they give like land speeder <laughs> permits out? Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> speeder bike. I was lucky to get to Galaxy's Edge, man. For someone who has pretty much seen it all when it comes to Star Wars, I mean, you've obviously the most prolific collector on the on the planet. Uh, you've actually had a cameo in a movie. So you think, well, a guy like Steve Sansweet, he's seen it all. He's done it all in the world of Star Wars. And then you go to Galaxy's Edge. And what's that like? It was... Effing amazing. (laughs) It was, uh, I'll tell you, we entered through Frontierland, and you enter through this tunnel of what looks like rock, red rock, and there were maybe 100 people ahead of me, so sort of crowding the entrance, but I could see above their heads, between their heads and and the top of the roof, and I got chills. Mm. up and down my spine i mean it was incredible just that that first look it just it brings uh it brings emotion and, and um steve what were you what were you actually looking at when you, the first thing you saw what was it buildings of um black spire outpost um so it's it's a it's 14 acres of star wars it's mm-hmm. um I mean, and that's a lot of space. And you go in there and it looks like a little village and you don't see any of the rest of Disneyland. Um, You don't hear anything because of the noises that are going on there. They pump in all kinds of noises. They even pump in smells. I could smell the roasting Ronto. It was just delicious. (laughs) Wow. Ronto. Well, the roasting Ronto and the yes. Well, at least you weren't walking through the. At least you weren't walking through the area where they uh, had the Eopi farts. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's the most unfortunate uh, smell. Uh, but really, I because that's interesting. I had read somewhere, you know, come to Galaxy's Edge and experience the sights the sounds and the smells of the Star Wars universe. So uh, you smelled uh, roasting Ronto meat. Well, I, yes, in my mind anyway. That's what Oh, I okay, thought. perfect, perfect. See, but your mind is probably like the perfect place to be when going into a place like this because... That's you, scary, Jimmy. Well, Steve, <laughs> listen, how long have we known you? How long have Star Wars fans known you? Uh, we uh, always have considered you an authority on all things Star Wars. So that's why I believe it's very important that we hear your assessment of this Star Wars land. You know, this land we've always kind of dreamed about. And uh, now we here it is. It's, we've been hearing about it for like the last four years. And now it's finally come to fruition. It is truly amazing. It, yes. it, it really is. It's, uh, it's well worth the effort to get there, the initial uh, stay of only four hours is not enough. It's enough to get on the ride. Mm-hmm. It's enough to have a bite or a drink at the cantina. And it's enough to make it through some of the shops. But I didn't even get to all of the shops. Mm. And, you know, for me, that was... Uh, well, oh, my God, yes. Right. And w- one of the things we've heard, Steve, is that, you know, it's not like these shops have big neon signs with the arrow pointing shop here. Things- there, is no, there is no signage at all. Right. So None. you're kind of on your own to just explore, and all of a sudden you find yourself, oh, here's a shop. Right. I, I wanted to find the creature shop, so I did ask about five people along the way, and eventually someone took... Uh, took mercy on me and said, I'll, I'll take you there. Mm. And so it's like a food court, but there are shops and it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's on the second level of, uh, of Black Spire Outpost. So there are two levels and um, it's near the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. 
which is a wonderful ride. Um, you you see the Falcon. It, the Falcon is like a hundred feet long, and it's it it looks real. I mean, it looks like you could get in it and fly it, which we did. Yeah. To to to, to get some connexium, coaxium, whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, which of it, we we understand that there are four possible stations. Uh, which uh, card did you draw? Three, three stations. Three stations. So there's, so there's the pilot, the gunner, and the engineer. And I was assigned the engineer. Funny that about two pods ahead of me was Alden Ehrenreich. Oh, no I, kidding! Oh. I really, I really wanted to ask him whether they trusted him to pilot the damn thing. <laughs> you know what? I would trust. Uh, I would trust him to pilot. But uh, <laughs> after the the mess that he made of it, you know, uh, in solo. I just, that's, a, that's unbelievable. I mean, just two pods away from. Yeah. Did you see any other celebrities there? I saw Bobby Moynihan. Mm-hmm. And yep. I understand. Rebels or uh, resistance. Resistance. And I understand that Billy B. Williams was there when I was there. And Mark Hamill from the night before. Um, and. Uh, some uh, some voice actors from some of the uh, animated shows. So, but that's all I saw. Wow. Have you ever been in a place where you could experience the just have the experience of being on board the Millennium Falcon in the way that it was presented at Galaxy's Edge? Because we've heard a lot of glowing reports about it, but I want to hear from the man himself, the the guy. Like I said, Steve, we all look to you. Uh, for your authentic appreciation of this kind of thing, there's Where nothing you... quite there's nothing quite like it, and and I I still don't know how they've done it um, because there are a lot of people that go through there. In fact, um, we were in line for about an hour because Disney had put through um, several groups of uh, young kids that were there um, on Disney's dime. And I thought that was great. Uh, make a wish kids and, and, uh, other kids wearing the same color t-shirt. So you knew they were together in various groups. And, um, you finally, you go through this long lineup inside the uh, docking bay and you get to an, a malfunctioning engine and there's some, you know, funny byplay there. And then you get to Hondo and Aka. And I'll tell you, the the animatronic figure is so state of the art. You you wouldn't it's hard to believe that it's not an actor in a costume and a mask. Wow. Uh this it isn't is, Chuck E. Cheese. This is not Chuck E. Cheese <laughs> by a long shot. And it's not even it's not even animatronics as you've seen it before. Like uh 3PO is an amazing animatronic in Star Tours, but this is you know, 30 years later, it's it's amazing. It's all of the moves of uh, of a being like a living, breathing person. And the biggest yeah. difference between depicting someone like Hondo, who is a weak way, as opposed to having three PO there is the fact three PO is supposed to move around like a robot. So right. it gives him a lot of latitude. <laughs> right now, this is this is quite 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 amazing and and hondo sort of tells you what your journey is about and it's to get <laughs> here we go again it is coaxium isn't it yes, yes. sir yeah why don't i come up with connexium i think that's some sort of <laughs> drug that'll be in solo too i think so so anyway it's it's to get coaxium for the resistance and uh, chewbacca is uh, letting you borrow the falcon and um you you bring back whatever coaxium you can get and uh, smuggle it back and of course Hondo takes a part of the uh, take but um, well there's always a little something in it for Hondo there's a little some there's a little something in it for Hondo yeah. so you, then you go through and you're in the uh, you're in the area the lounge area where the uh, the Jarek table is and you get to sit on the couch there um and you take your picture with it in front of or in back of the the jarrick table the hollow chest table 
and and then they give you your cards they call your group they call the groups by color and we were in the green group the six of us just four people who um were just ahead of us in line and they just randomly hand out the the cards so you're either a pilot uh a gunner or an engineer and bob and i were engineers so we sat in the back of the of the uh cabin the six seats three on each side and um our pilot no offense if she's listening, but <laughs> did she? But did she know that you were in the car with her? I mean, did she? No, these people. No, I, I didn't know these people. Okay, um, all right. They kept they kept crashing the Falcon. Oh. It was it, it was a little disheartening. Oh, you but didn't we, make it in twelve parsecs, is what you're we saying? We didn't make it in twelve parsecs. How many parsecs would you say, Steve? Well, at Great least performance. At least thirteen or fourteen, maybe fifteen. <laughs> fifteen parsecs. But but at least we got one coaxium capsule. I don't know how many you can get all together, mm. but we got one. And it's the engineer's job to uh, put the grappling uh, hooks out to grab the uh, capsule. So we did that right. But Bob was really uh, concentrating on all the flashing lights and the buttons that you push and the mm. levers that you pull. And I was concentrating more on the ride. So at the end of the ride, he scored a 92% and I scored a 58%. <laughs> yeah, but you had a but better visual experience. I, I think so. Bob, I Bob's, the, oh, Bob's definitely the overachiever. Uh, uh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, but he walks away you know, saying, oh, I saw a bunch of blinking lights and put a bunch of switches. And you are like, well, we jumped to light speed. <laughs> yeah, we jumped to light speed a couple of times. So it, wow. was, uh, it was very, very cool. And the ship really you know, gives you a rock and roll. It, uh, it moves quite the... Uh, Quite a bit. So you think Jason uh, will puke. I want to take him on it. Do you think he's going to blow? No, out? I think he'll be fine as long as he doesn't have too much Ronto stew beforehand. <laughs> Steve, did you try any of the food? I did not because we had eaten a, uh, a fairly big lunch before we got in there. Our time was three to seven. So we waited in line to, we wanted to see what the cantina looked like, but we waited in line and then you get to the head of the line and then you give your cell phone number and um and then they text you and they said it would be about 30 minutes and they text you and they give you 10 minutes to get back there and so they did and it was only about 20 minutes and um so they hand us a menu and i'm looking at it and there's this food and drink and neither of us felt like eating or drinking and there's there's really no way or there wasn't a way that we figured out to go in and just look mm. uh, so we decided uh, that I wanted to do more shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Go uh, figure. Well, the really, the really bad thing was it was the day before opening day to the public, so they were not set up to ship things out of the park like all the other shops mm, in Disney. Oh, okay. So I, I had a very limited take, um, but I did do the lightsaber um building session and that was phenomenal now, which, uh, which is, hilt did you go with steve do you have a preference this there are four different types of um hilts okay and each of the hilts has let's see one two three four five major pieces and for each of the five major pieces, there are two choices. Oh, I see. oh, so, so it really is custom and build your own. This is insane. so yeah. there could be there could be twenty thousand different oh, lightsaber wow. heads. Wow! Because three of us in a row, I was next to Athena Portillo, who is the executive producer of uh, Resistance. She's and great. Someone else from um, from from uh, uh, Lucasfilm. And we all picked the same, and I'm forgetting what the name of this particular kind of hilt was. And we all ended up with, we all had picked the same drawer that we looked at, and um, uh, we all ended up with totally different lightsabers. Oh, yeah, so so many different combinations. So you build the hilt, and you're listening to um, to the 
shopkeeper and the shopkeeper and she was telling us all about the force and lightsabers and Yoda speaks to you and uh it's it's really it's really quite uh, impressive so Yoda and speaks to you now that, that there's a bit of a scoop we've not heard yeah. this that you hear the voice of Yoda yes during Yoda. the construction of the lightsaber that's very cool so you put your pieces together and they help you if you're having any trouble and it is a heavy hilt it's heavier than the hilts of the force fx lightsabers mm. they're beautifully done and you have a real choice in uh, in in what you want. You have to watch out though while you're picking. You pick your your from your basic drawers outside, and if the uh, first order comes along, you have to shut up immediately. And it happened. Kylo Ren and two first order stormtroopers came along as we were waiting in line outside, and. Um, all of a sudden, they went from talking about the, um, the the lightsabers, which they were doing very quietly, to selling scrap metal. How many credits am I made for this piece oh of God. scrap metal? <laughs> so this, so this is more than an opportunity to create your own souvenir. It's an experience in itself. It sounds like it is. It is a twenty minute experience. And wow! It was it was really pretty amazing. Um, and uh, and and great fun, and you you just didn't know what you were in for, and uh, finally the uh, the bad guys left, and everybody breathed a sigh of relief. So the the training of the um, of the cast members is significant. Um, the way they, you know, uh, I I don't know what you're talking about. You mean uh, you mean. Uh, lightsabers no but there's a scrap metal shop um mm. <laughs> so uh you have to know what to look for or you have to ask often enough that they finally break down and sort of whisper it to you yeah because i these people these these actors uh they take it very seriously they're not breaking character for anything they right you are in star wars and you know um there's there's sort of been sort of two schools of thought there's there's there are those that say, well, you know, why didn't they go with something like Tatooine or Hoth or a combination? Uh, they went with a place in Star Wars that we had never been. And uh, for, for me, I feel like that's the most, uh, maybe not the most intuitive thing to do, but it, it's the most logical thing to do. It, it, was, it was clearly, having been there, it was clearly the right thing to do. It gave them the most creative freedom. I mean, you still have a cantina, you still have uh, um, restaurants, you still have uh, gift shops, but the the merchandise is all in fantasy too. Yeah, um, which is uh, which is another thing that that I really loved. I mean, you you don't have t shirts that are emblazoned Galaxy's Edge. You can find that stuff in Star Trader out with uh, with um, uh, Star Tours. But once inside the land, everything is specific to the land, and you find little dolls and mm. stuffed um, stuffed toys that are look like almost handmade, yeah. carved wooden pieces. I mean, just very, very clever. Um, when when you go to the creature shop and you buy a uh, a Minoc or a uh, Bantha or a Kowakian monkey lizard. <laughs> Um, you get you get boxes that look like uh, cages, mm. big cardboard boxes that are this. It, it's all themed so perfectly. It really is. So did you buy half the stuff? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't even get to the to Doc Ondas where a lot of the toys were. Mm. Um, so uh, I I was very happy with my lightsaber and a couple of creatures, a bantha and a. Tauntaun and the Honda's Kowakian monkey lizard, whose name I forget. Um, oh, it's like Pliff Plaff or something. Like that. I didn't even something. know he had a name. Does he have a so, name? I think he has a name somewhere. Yeah, he does. Yeah. He sure does. Yeah. But uh, well, I'm sure you know you've eyeballed a few things too that well, are on I, your future wish list. I want to get back. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Well, I, I know you have plenty of friends who will be going there, and you can maybe oh, yeah. say, hey, if you don't mind, I got a little checklist here. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to be making the trip next month, so if you want me to ship a few things to you, just let me know. Yeah, I've especially when the, when the four-hour uh, thing ends and you have time to spend – you know, most of your time there. I don't know how they're going to do it, frankly. I, like I don't know the how they're going to get people out of there. Well, you I like, like having... before. I do because I think that it just helps regulate the crowds better and um, prevents the long-term squatters from really sinking their roots in. So if you have to go a few different times to fully experience a thing, that's fine. To me, that adds to the longevity of the park to begin with. So I could clearly go back a number of times and still have fun there because there are many things to explore. And and the second ride won't be ready until probably the end of the year, the rise of the resistance. And, we'll be back. We'll be back. So, yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be a thing. And after your four hours are up, so you go on Star Tours a few times after that. You know, you still have more Star Wars you can immerse yourself in. Oh, well, I went on Star Tours again. That was for sure. <laughs> yes, you have to. You have to. So you bought the saber, and it's a personal, unique Steve Sand Sweet lightsaber. It so is. where where do you put something like that on display in the world's largest Star Wars collection at Rancho Obi-Wan? Well, right now it's my in my office because I'm playing with it. So. <laughs> Envisioning and, how you might be head or you can, move limbs from well, some podcast know. hosts that you've you, known for a long time. You, you never know if they're if they're in the vicinity. I might just do that. And what color is the blade, Steve? What did you? The go blade with? is blue. I picked I picked a blue kyber crystal. You could you can go from blue, red, green, purple, and white. Oh, and yeah, okay, you right. can also, yeah, well, that's the Sokas. Right, yeah. yeah. And you can also um, use your kyber crystal and put the same crystal that's powering your lightsaber into a holocron, either a Jedi or a Sith holocron, oh, wow. which you can get at Doc Gondas. So the, the same crystal can go into the holocron. The same crystal goes into wow. the holocron and speaks. So it makes I'm, the holocron noises and then oh speaks God. to you. That, and, oh my God. <laughs> and and the blue the blue crystal could be any one of several characters who had blue lightsabers, mm-hmm. and the red crystal could be Darth Vader, Darth Maul, um, Darth Sidious, or um, what's his face? <laughs> <laughs> Darth, uh, Darth Maul, Darth Sidious, Darth Plagueis. Uh, what Darth are we leaving out? Um, are we leaving out a Darth? Yes. I think we. I think we covered all the bases. No, 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 no. I'm blanking on episode two. Oh, oh, oh Darth Tyrannus. Tyrannus, right? Darth of course. Tyrannus. Yeah, but I mean, really, <laughs> you know, we Jim's all looking for a loophole here. For <laughs> always, I'm not. But who refers to the character as Darth Tyrannus other than Sidious himself right. in the universe? Everyone refers to that character as Count Dooku. Yes. Darth Tyrannus, get out of here. That's not even a good name. No wonder he got you want him to be beheaded. He's like, oh, wait. Off with I'm, your head in your hands. I, I guess it is It is Sidious who is the one distributing the name. So he's like, oh, I just had a kind of a brain fart that day. I don't know. Tyrannus. Tyr- Tyrannus. So you don't, know, you, don't, you don't know what character you're getting. You can mm. pick the color, but you don't know what character you're getting. See, oh. that, that's just going to cause a whole thing with you, with you collectors, right? What do you mean, you collectors? You're a collector. Well, I know, I know, but I mean, not on the not on the scale of a Steve Sansweet or a nobody, a Gus or a Duncan or you know, these guys okay, are going to be well, all like, "All right, I got a mall. You, who's got a Vader?" And you, you're staring at this little plate of like. That's the only, that's the only way to do it. Yeah, because uh, the only way to figure it out. Well, they're different shaped, slightly mm, different oh, shape. Okay. But just, you don't know. But they're sealed in a capsule, so you don't know what you're getting until you open it. Then I guess you could trade, or maybe somebody on eBay has already figured out who their, you know, their crystal is and yeah. is mm-hmm. selling it. There's a lot of eBay traffic already on the Galaxy's Edge stuff. I'll bet. I'll bet. Now, Steve, as you uh, as you accumulate more of these items from Galaxy's Edge, does it inspire you to say? 
well, maybe this is going to eventually need its own area in, in, in Rancho Obi-Wan because of sort of the uniqueness of them. I mean, how do you even decide where this stuff should go? Or do you just say, hey, Ann, where should this stuff go? We'll have to figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> because as the 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 parks are open, uh, they're going to start turning over the merch and we're going to see new things, yeah, new well, things. Oh, my God. Yeah, since there are only 700 different items right now. Um... <laughs> only 700? <laughs> oh, God. No wonder yes. four hours wasn't enough. No, no. But uh, it, it it entices me to go back. So mm-hmm. that's the uh, that's the main thing. That's amazing. I would love to walk around that park with you, Steve. That would be a blast. But if if we can't go together, I will take a shopping list from you, and I will try to fulfill whatever Rancho Obi Wan needs. That's a deal. Uh, yes, that's a deal. Because yeah, seven hundred different items. I heard the most expensive item is twenty five thousand dollars. I believe. It's- and there's only one of them. What, and, if, what is that item? I, actually, I, I, I just if, saw the headline. I bet if they sell it, they'll get another. But it's it is a fully functioning R two D two unit. That's what I thought it was. Yeah. Oh. Full size, you know the the regular remote control, just like the R two builders would do. And it 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 now is the most expensive thing Star Wars available to the public. The previous most expensive thing was uh, the Yoda statue, which uh, the park had one of a few years ago, the uh, Larry Lawrence Noble Yoda statue, which is the bronze, beautiful bronze oh. statue that's on the fountain outside uh, the Lucas Digital Arts Center. And that was a $15,000 uh, piece. That was fifteen grand, and there was only one of them? Because the only ones I know of existence... Okay, let's see if I can figure this out. There's the one at Presidio that in, in the fountain that everyone takes their photos at. There's the park in San Anselmo. Imagination Park. There's Rancho Obi-Wan. And there is... Big Rock. Big, Big Rock. Rock. There's one at Big Rock. But there so are that's more. four. Doesn't George own one himself? Like, George he probably... Jones. Yeah, George owns one. It's probably at his house, at one okay. of his houses. So that's five. And, and then number six is the one they sold at the Disney Park. Well, there were also five uh, artist proofs. And George got one of the artist proofs. And uh, f- four friends and I were the ones who actually commissioned the Bronze Yoda. Ooh. Did Larry keep one? Does he have one? I don't think Lawrence has one. No. Um, His art is just, that's there for everyone else. I think that's how he looks at it. They were sold to the public. Um, So there were 25 that were made. Mm. So there were several that were sold to Japan. And so there are individuals who have one. You know, I think $15,000 is downright reasonable and almost a bargain for that piece of artwork. And uh, I'm a little upset, maybe, you know, a second mortgage, <laughs> things, things of that nature, you know, yeah, I'm because sure Wendy I mean, would be totally cool with that. I wouldn't tell her. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't right. tell her. Yeah. She would like, she wouldn't notice. Where are you going to put that? <laughs> put it in the breakfast room. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think I'd be spending the rest of my life with the Yoda statue and no family. At the, at the YMCA. That's yeah. where, right. <laughs> enjoy each other. Well, I don't have much, but I got the Yoda statue. Right. Well, just think, you didn't get the Yoda statue, but now you can get your own R2-D2. Yeah, for That's true. Man. That is cool. Oh or, you, or you could build your own droid. So there's, not only can you build a lightsaber, you can build your own droid. And that looks like great fun, too. So those are are much smaller. They're like what would you say, like one six scale, maybe? They're about um, twelve to fifteen inches high. I mean, pretty good size. Oh. Yeah, they're big. Now, wh- what kind of material are those made of? Are they plastic or are they metal? Yeah, they're plastic. But they're, they're plastic. Yeah. They're they're very cool. I saw a bunch of them out. The people were playing with or showing me and. You can build either a, an R2 D2 type uh, or a BB8 type, but with different tops and 
all kinds of different. It's just sort of like the lightsaber. There are any number of variations on bodies and heads and accessories. And so it really is a custom droid. I imagine people will be going back multiple times and building collections. And soon we'll be seeing these showcases, these spotlights online of people's amazing build your own droids from galaxy's edge. I would bet that is true. And isn't that the thing you love the most about Rancho Obi-Wan? It's not the mass produced stuff, which is cool, but you love the unique items, the one of a kind, the fan made items, the folk art. That's the stuff that really probably, if I know you as well as I think I do, Steve, those are the things that motivate you the most as a collector. Yes, absolutely. And and they have figured out a way to sort of approach that kind of, wow, this is something I created, both with the lightsaber and with the droids. And I think that's a very smart idea. I love it. I love and it. And it's part of that whole interactivity, the immersiveness, um, you know, build your own, figure it out, take part in the galaxy. Uh, it's uh, it's part of uh, a lot of creative thought and effort that has gone into this part of the park. I love it. You know, I, I remember seeing clips of George Lucas as he would look at some of the merchandise and the things that are out and I, and he would say, wow, this, this is really cool. This is cooler than what we actually use in the, in the making of the movie. He was always amazed at what the, the fans and um, the, the folks creating the merchandise were able to pull off and, Steve, you're somebody that was there. You were there on the set of uh, of episode one. You had a cameo in that film. And how does this compare, the Galaxy's Edge experience, to being actually on the set of a Star Wars film? Well, that's a totally different experience, but um, th- this was much more immersive. I mean, when you're on the set of a film, you see uh, there's a lot of stuff that's green. Yeah, right. So a lot of a lot of green screen and some blue screen and the cameras are there and there's George shouting action and cut. Um, And so you you can there's a thrill, uh, but it's a different kind of thrill. And uh, being in this immersive environment and uh, and seeing the cast members all dressed up in uh Star Wars type regalia and being able to share it with a bunch of uh, a bunch of other fans. Um, it's uh, it's a great experience. It's one not to be missed. Yeah. The name of Hondo Onaka's Kawakian monkey lizard <laughs> is Pick McCuck, McMuck. What? No, that's Wait a minute. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Of course, whoa, whoa. Of course <laughs> it is. <laughs> no, I didn't say Pick that. Pick my what? No, hey, pick <laughs> McMuck. Oh, pick, Mc, uh, no, no, wait, hold on, not McMuck. McMuck. That's that's the Irish Kawaki monkey lizard. That's the Irish monkey lizard. No, pick <laughs> Muck Muck. Pick Muck Muck. Pick Muck Muck. Pick Muck Muck. Uh, I, I, I knew I heard that name somewhere before. <laughs> voiced, voiced in the cartoon by Matt Lanter. Oh, so, oh, yeah. I, now that all that I remember that. I remember the fact that Matt did the voice for that. Um, but hey, Steve, I have a, I, a a small confession to make. I was thinking of you just a few weeks ago as I was, I got back from Star Wars Celebration Chicago. And it was such a wonderful time, and as I, it, who doesn't hate to unpack? I was there. I was unpacking. I was kind of grumbling about it as I was putting my things away. You know, like my toothpaste and all that. And then all of a sudden, I started thinking about. What it must be like to be Steve Sansweet unpacking after a trip to Star Wars Celebration with everything that you brought. I don't think I quite know the, the, the scale of what really unpacking after a convention is like. We're not quite unpacked fully yet. <laughs> what was the coolest thing you picked up at Celebration? Oh, my goodness gracious. Coolest I, thing I picked yeah, up. Yeah, I know you have I, a favorite. I know you have a favorite in there. I can't think offhand. A lot of the, uh, the, there was a great, somebody did a great behind the scenes color form set. Um, I just saw a photo of that. Uh, yeah, online. we put that up on, 
yeah, we put that up on the Rancho Facebook page, and it is amazing. I mean, they have the sound guys and George Lucas, as well as some of the actors. And mm-hmm. um, Jason, do you remember those old color oh. forms that that kids would play with? Love you took color those forms. Yeah. It was like reusable stickers that you and that's, put on. And that's what these are. They're vinyl stickers that you can reuse, and mm-hmm. there's a backdrop of uh, Tatooine, and um, and it's just some amazing creative fan who is a graphic artist who who made it and i'm forgetting his name of course but uh, oh it's it's absolutely brilliant jason it, you got to check this out it's on the rancho obi one facebook page and it features as the backdrop the um literally the exterior set of the Lars homestead from ep four. And you see just the treads of the sand crawler, not the whole thing, maybe a moisture evaporators there. And then the color forms are of oh, I'm looking George at it Lucas, Gary Kurtz, Robert Watts, you know, yeah, the boom, my guy, <laughs> the guy oh, working on the lightning rig. It's, it's, yeah, no, amazing, amazing stuff. So yeah, I think that's, one of the favorite pieces that I brought back from celebration and everybody, everybody had swag and it was, uh, it was was the most swagalicious convention I have ever been to in my entire life. So, uh, it was great. It's almost as if, if you don't have a patch, then go home because you know, everyone's got a patch or a pin or a coin or something else. Uh, it's pretty, pretty spectacular. So there's been a lot of Star Wars going on, and uh, and uh, uh, there'll be some more at San Diego Comic Con. At least I'm a special guest there, and going to do a That's couple right. of panels. Oh, so uh, looking forward to that. Tell uh, us about the panels. Well, um, they haven't announced them yet, so I can't quite tell you about them. But I'm doing one, and it's going to be sort of. Uh, uh, my my trip from the Wall Street Journal to Lucasfilm and beyond. That's and it's an amazing story, Steve. And you know that's something we really don't take the deep dive into too much. Is a whole biography of you. There's always so much current Star Wars stuff. So many different cool things happening in Rancho Obi Wan all the time. We never really take a deep dive into really. W- how and why you got to where you are today. And uh, so that sounds like an amazing panel. Yeah, it'll be fun. Steve, there's one question that I've been wanting to ask you for a little while. Ever since, and, and, and maybe you have no opinion on this at all, but I'm just curious. Ever since Hasbro announced, and because this has sort of been an obsession of mine lately because I've been on the hunt for these things, the retro vintage action figure. So this is the re-release of... right. You know, vintage style, there's talk about, well, they're a little bit shorter and blah, blah, blah. Um, And there's some out there that look at that and they go, oh, this is blasphemy that, you know, that was a lightning in a bottle moment. We don't want we don't need these things reproduced. And there are others that say, well, wait a minute, I never had a chance to own those. And now I do as uh, as as the grand poobah of, of of collecting. Do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think it's crazy that people are debating this or is that just no, people debate everything when it comes to star wars so that doesn't surprise me at all <laughs> well, but i true. i that think that true. there's nothing wrong with those uh toys i mean they're clearly they're clearly marked both on the toys and on the the packaging of course is very different uh, the front looks right. sort of similar but the packaging is very different than the original uh uh action figures and um, I think it's fun, and I, it's certainly not going to affect uh, downward the price of the vintage figures. If anything, it's going to get more people to want the actual figures that right. came out back in 1978. I uh, totally agree. So I, I think they're cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad to hear you say that, because I've just um, – the. The increase in uh, value of those original vintage figures that, you know, used to be even just up to – uh, ten years ago, you could go to a flea market. You could go to a toy show and 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 pick up beater figures for a couple of bucks. You can't touch even a beater figure for under ten, fifteen dollars. It seems like they've right. And if you're talking about on the card, oh. then uh, yeah, it's uh, very difficult. Very yeah. difficult. Yeah. But, uh, and I like the fact that they did a vintage uh, Grand Moff Tarkin. 
which everybody has always said, why wasn't there a Tarkin figure in the original line? Yeah. And so they've done a, a, a vintage style Tarkin that comes with a board game. Steve, out of all the Star Wars characters, aliens, creatures, what have you, from like the original trilogy, is there any other character that you can think of outside of Tarkin that might that, that's something you've always wanted to see in the vintage format that never happened. I'd have to give that some thought, but nothing really. Yeah, they were pretty uh, good. They were, they were pretty uh, complete when they did it. I, and I, somebody posed this question to me recently and I found myself also kind of um, hemming and hawing. I, I didn't really jump in an immediate connection with anyone. I, I thought of the cantina Maybe I'd like to see a Duros. Right. The Duros, I think, have been underrepresented in the vintage hey. area. Um, or a uh, Devranian, the uh, the devil guy. Oh, yeah. Maybe that would be kind of cool to see vintage-wise. Kyle Newman's always talking about wanting that R1 droid from outside the city. Yeah, there are, there are certainly droids. I mean, with all the figures that have come out, um, uh, there are certainly figures that they could do in the vintage line that uh, that – were never made. Yeah, it'd be a lot of fun to see if they, if Hasbro wants to continue down that that course because I I think a lot of collectors and fans are responding to it. Yeah. So much so that Target is now selling the vintage figures in the men's clothesware department. So. Oh God. Um, they, I, and then they look at me like I'm crazy that I didn't figure that out. They go, oh, they're in the men's clothing area. Well, of course they are. Of course they are. Yeah. Because we know it's just you older guys who want them. <laughs> right. Right. Um, I don't want to bring the conversation down, Steve, but I, I do think that it would be appropriate. We have not spoken to you uh, since the passing of Peter Mayhew. And we and I, I'm sure that you crossed paths uh, with uh, with Peter many times. Yes. Is there anything in particular, any 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 stories or or anecdotes that you you, you might want to share with us uh, about Peter? Well, I think the amazing thing about Peter and what a lot of fans don't realize is, I mean, he probably more than any of the other so called men behind the mask was just went around the world and did fan conventions and probably met more fans who have an attachment to him because of both the character and because of him as a person and having met him in, in person. Um, so much of that time he was in lots of pain. Hmm. I mean, he was in pain most of his life and it got worse as he got older. Um, but you just didn't know it. I mean, he, you know, he may have had a, a bad day or two where he, you know, he couldn't make it to the floor, but that would be really, really rare. He never wanted to disappoint the fans. And right. and uh, above all else, you know, I, I really give it to him for that. And knowing, you know, what, what how he was hurting inside, but um, just never, never let on. Yeah. You know, it's kind of similar to the character of Chewbacca himself, you know, someone you could rely on someone you could count on. And I think Peter embodied a lot of that. I think he yeah. took that very seriously. There's more to Chewbacca than meets the eye. And I think Peter is responsible for a lot of that. And Galaxy's Edge was dedicated to him. Angie By was Harrison. there. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and Angie was there and uh, um, was able to see it. And uh, it, it was a great, uh, a great moment. Mm. Yeah. Sure was. Sure was. So, Steve, uh, Galaxy's Edge, uh, Star Wars Celebration Chicago, uh, all that behind us. What's going on in the future of uh, Rancho Obi-Wan? It's not the, Disney Galaxy's Edge isn't the only mecca for Star Wars fans. Clearly, uh, Rancho Obi-Wan is, uh, is right up there as well. And we had a, a freelance reporter here who's doing a piece for the uh, Seattle Times about uh, – uh, what people can do on a trip, on a road trip from Seattle down to uh, Disneyland. And uh, and one of the things you can do is stop at Rancho Obi-Wan. So Perfect. I'm uh, yeah. happy with that. 
and we're doing some more uh, PR uh, for a new book, which is coming out this fall, oh. which I can't give any more details about. Since it's what? Not, I, what? I what? I not my book. I have no, my, no idea. No, no, What's this? No, no, it's not my book. It's somebody, oh, okay. But right. We're we're just doing something here at Rancho Obi Wan uh, to promote it. And, uh, yeah, you know, we're going to turn around and it's going to be Celebration Anaheim before we know it. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, maybe you shouldn't unpack all that stuff. Just leave some of it all crated up. Well, I think Anne is going to keep all the supplies all together and uh, not uncrate that stuff. Did you guys get around to unpacking stew? <laughs> Damn, I knew there was something we forgot. <laughs> you didn't hear the scratching? <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to get to that. <laughs> oh, man. Soon. Oh, for sure. Well, Very Steve, um, as always, it's just beyond uh, a thrill to get to talk to you. And, and certainly with so much exciting things happening in the world of Star Wars, we've got the, the big park. Uh, we've got another convention on its way and, uh, and and some movie I hear about coming out in December. Yeah, there's some movie in December, yeah. right? And, and all this talk about the end of the Skywalker saga, you know, Jim and I, we vacillate back and forth on that. And, you know, for those of us and, and you know, you're there at the very, very beginning um, that that's that was our introduction to Star Wars was the Skywalker family and the Skywalker saga. Uh, is it? Is it bittersweet to you? Is it? What do you make of this whole end of the Skywalker saga thing? Are you ready to move on to other things in terms of I'll let's, in the universe? I'll let you know after I see the movie. Hey, oh, that's fair. It that's has fair. to do a lot of it has to do with the movie and how it's wrapped up. Yeah, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. right. And I think right. we'll be seeing. I think we'll be seeing classic Star Wars for years and years to come. Even though it may be the end of the saga, as far as the nine movies are concerned um uh the skywalker name will be uh long in existence well and how about that mandalorian stuff that we saw it uh, oh very exciting wow i mean so there's all kinds of new new stuff coming up and the cassian andor series and and who knows what else they'll be uh putting on uh, disney plus but uh, they'll keep the star wars stuff coming i'm sure you know what? I want to see a reality show about Rancho Obi Wan on that Disney Plus. Yes, I'm still God, holding been, out. Oh for that. my God! Have we not been talking about that forever? Uh, come up with the script, guys. <laughs> script? script? It's reality, Steve. You don't write it. Come on. <laughs> I've been there. You can't write that stuff. <laughs> a day in the life. <laughs> oh, I mean, man. the chickens alone. I... <laughs> right. I can see the April May plushies. <laughs> we have April. We have April May plushies. Do you have April May plushies? Oh, yes. yes. The the pets, the chickens, the cats, the dogs. Everything has been merchandised. I knew they had it, the chickens. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't see the April May. Well, she's a cutie. She just had a birthday not too long ago. Yep. An anniversary yep. there. So, uh, well, anyway, thank you so much for uh, joining pleasure, us and, and and sharing all the. The details in your uh, firsthand experience there at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And everyone, uh, please go to RanchoObiWan.org and make sure that you become a member and support the great mission there in keeping all of these great memories alive for many, 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 many years to come. So, the great Steve Sansweet, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Steve. Okay. Take care. All right.